You probably think you've seen The Muppet Christmas Carol. After all, it's a beloved film in the highest tier of Christmas movies that people watch year after year during the holiday season. But again, have you seen this Muppet masterpiece as it was originally intended? Or are you watching the inferior version that Disney has forced all of us to watch for decades? Let me explain. It's a good beginning. It's creepy and kind of woohoo, spooky. Oh, thank you, Rizzo. You're welcome, Mr. Dickens. When Disney set out to adapt Dickens' classic novel with the Muppets, there was an emphasis on tonal balance. On one hand, they wanted to honor the gravity of the source material. And they did this in large part by hiring an Academy Award-winning actor for the role of Ebenezer Scrooge. Michael Caine brought the same intensity and reverence to the performance that he would bring to any other dramatic role. How would the bookkeepers like to be suddenly... Michael Caine told the film's director, Brian Henson, I'm going to play this movie like I'm working with the Royal Shakespeare Company. I will never wink. I will never do anything Muppety. I am going to play Scrooge as if it is an utterly dramatic role and there are no puppets around me. In a majority of his scenes, Michael Caine is the only human actor on screen. It would have been really easy for him to roll his eyes or dismiss the material as childish, but instead, his authenticity elevates the entire film. <laughs> I, I will honor Christmas and try to keep it all the year. With the reverence for the source material covered, Disney wanted to balance that with humor and lightheartedness that would appeal to children. Obviously, that's mainly accomplished with a screen full of Muppets, but a majority of the levity and humor comes from the excellent pairing of our narrators. Boy, this really is a dirty city. <laughs> you telling me? <laughs> Thank you for making me a part of this. The Great Gonzo, performing as Charles Dickens, and Rizzo the Rat. Welcome to the Muppet Christmas Carol. I am here to tell the story. And I am here for the food. Having these dual narrators is just another way this film was able to honor the original source material, because they're then able to quote Dickens' beautiful prose from the novel verbatim. The Marleys were dead to begin with. To say that Scrooge was not startled would be untrue. And Scrooge was conscious of a thousand odors, each one connected with a thousand thoughts and hopes and joys and cares. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city ever had. <laughs> but they also serve as guides for the children who are getting introduced to this story for the first time. Rizzo serves as a conduit to the audience, asking all the clarifying questions the children might need. They sprinkle in humor to make it more palatable and to keep their attention from drifting. You can fit through those bars? Yeah. You are such an idiot. What? And when Scrooge comes face to face with the ghost of Christmas yet to come, Gonzo and Rizzo remove themselves from the narrative. I don't think I want to see any more. Oh, when you're right, you're right. You're on your own, folks. We'll meet you at the finale. Yeah. Cueing the audience into the importance of this section without undercutting it with slapstick humor. In letting the film take a slight turn towards horror, the movie preserves the important lessons of Dickens' story. And it gives Kane as Scrooge a chance to reach the character's emotional climax. It's the perfect example of the filmmakers doing right in how they deliver this story to the audience while being mindful of the overall tonal balance. But in a classic move of overthinking by the studio and ultimately not respecting their audience, Disney cut out a vital scene before its theatrical run and in doing so, diminished the emotional arc of Scrooge and the narrative structure of the film. Those who have seen the film and who know the Dickens story generally will remember the basic structure. The stingy, grumpy, mean old Scrooge travels through time, first with the ghost of Christmas past, in order to see the pivotal moments in his youth that made him the man he is today. While in the past, he sees himself as a young man meeting a young woman named Belle, with whom he would fall in love. Ebenezer, this is Belle, a friend of the Fozzywick family. We witness brief moments of their time together, and then later see their relationship come to a painful end, thus explaining Scrooge's present demeanor, his obsession with wealth, and his disdain for the Christmas season. What you may not know, however, is that this scene originally included a love ballad sung by Belle called When Love Is Gone. When love is gone, when love is gone. This song was filmed and included in the cut presented to the studio by Henson and his team. The song sheds light on the demise of Scrooge and Belle's relationship. Belle, through the song, tells us more about Scrooge's actions 
and how he prioritizes wealth and his career over their relationship, and because of that, she must move on. There's distance in your eyes tonight, so we're not meant to be. Later, seeming to predict the journey on which Scrooge would eventually take, she sings, Be careful or you may regret the choice you make someday. It's clear that she has an outlook on life that Scrooge, not until this very moment, looking back at his past, has failed to see. And when he does, old Scrooge begins to sing with Belle. And yes, some dreams come true. And yes, some dreams fall through. When old Scrooge sings, it marks a key moment, what literary scholars might refer to as anagnorisis. A moment in the story in which a character makes a discovery that produces a change from ignorance to knowledge. Watching old Scrooge sing with Belle is an incredibly powerful moment. The fact that it's been so many years and Scrooge still remembers the words shows just how much Belle and this moment meant to him. And the crack in Kane's voice when he sings gets me every time. <laughs> oh, <there's> a... <laughs> And again, in a classic studio move of making the wrong choice for the wrong reason, Disney cut the song from its theatrical release. The studio wanted the film to be shorter, and clearly felt that such a love ballad wouldn't appeal to younger viewers. It's a baffling choice on several levels, but perhaps the most important is that the removal of the song muddies Scrooge's motivation and diminishes the full impact of his completed character arc at the end of the film. Merry Christmas. In the final scene, after Scrooge has awoken from his eventful night of spectral encounters and has become a changed man, Scrooge, the Cratchit family, and other townsfolk sing a song called When Love is Found, It Feels Like Christmas, which begins with Scrooge and Tiny Tim singing, The love we found, the love we found. This callback to When Love is Gone marks the completion of Scrooge's emotional arc, the lessons he's learned, and his resolution to live life anew. He has become a different person, a better person, and the two songs tell us that, almost like bookends. The leitmotif and melody of that first song, the one he sings with his lost love bell, comes back in a more positive light here. When love is gone, when love is gone, the love we found. The love we found. And without that original song, without the glimpse it gives us into Scrooge's despair and pain, his growth and change carries far less of an emotional impact. And fans have never forgotten or forgiven this. Belle's song remains a favorite of fans who got to enjoy it on VHS tape decades ago. However, when the film eventually made its way to DVD and Blu-ray, the song was, a bit too ironically, lost. According to a 2018 interview with director Brian Henson, we made a video master with When Love Is Gone, then we cut it out, spliced the negative for the theatrical release. But in the process, they lost the video master and they still have not been able to find the negative. They're still searching. I call them like every month to ask if they're still looking. One of these days, they'll find it. Well, that day has finally come. In 2020, it was reported that Disney had found the original cut of the film with the lost scene. And so fans who have been clinging to their old VHS copies, or the fans like me who have been pausing the movie and clicking over to YouTube to watch the lost scene, can finally rejoice. On December 9th of this year, a full uncut version of the film will make its debut on Disney+. And so for those of you who have never before seen the entire film in all its glory, now is your chance to watch this Muppet masterpiece the way it was originally intended. This video is sponsored by my podcast of Mice and Men and Monsters, where Dungeons and Dragons elements are dropped into the worlds of classic novels you either love or completely avoided while in school. The Dungeon Master is a high school English teacher who guides us through these familiar worlds and familiar characters. So far, we've played through books like Frankenstein, Moby Dick, Robin Hood, The Great Gatsby, Macbeth, and Oliver Twist, and we're only just getting started. The popular site Gizmodo included us on a list of six Dungeons & Dragons actual plays that are easy to start listening to. 
And Yahoo just recently had us on their list of 11 Dungeons & Dragons podcasts that roll a natural 20. If you like D&D, games, comedy, literature, or just a couple of friends acting like idiots and having a good time, then please click over and listen to episode one here on YouTube. I'll have it linked below. And you can listen to the rest of our episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it and share it with a friend. And leave me a comment below. Tell me, what's your favorite Christmas movie that you watch every single year? Just in some way, if you could please engage with this video, that way we can appease the algorithm gods and persuade them to push this video to more people. Just another reminder to go check out my podcast of Mice and Men and Monsters. We actually just recorded a special one-off episode where we play in the world of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. So it's really fitting, good timing. If you love the Christmas Carol and want to see me and some of my friends play in that world with D&D, &D, then make sure you're following the podcast because that episode will be released in a few days. I'm already hard at work for my last essay of the calendar year and I really hope you enjoy that. But until then, I'll see you in the next video.